What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all doing well. It is good to be back here in the studio. Never spend eight days straight in Las Vegas, Nevada. You will go insane. But all things considered, I'm doing pretty good. I wanted to talk to you guys about the Enthu Elite build that I assembled late last year. And uh, I think we're ready for testing. It, it boots, it's all good to go, it's up and running. And um, it's very impressive on paper. This is, this is about a $12,000 rig, more or less. And so now I want to actually put it through the ringer to see what it's made of. In this video, we'll be talking about overclocking our CPU and both of our GPUs that are in our SLI configuration, as well as taking a look at gaming performance and even some, uh, some benchmarks when it comes to our NVMe RAID 0 array, which is also quite beastly. If you guys haven't watched part one through three, the, uh, the whole build process from start to finish, um, that's up. You can go ahead and check it out if you want. You can watch it before or after this one. At any rate, for those of you who have not seen those videos, or if you just need a refresher, I'll quickly go over the specs. Uh, we've got a Core i9-7980XE, which has been, uh, it's the Gamer's Nexus Edition, because it was uh, hand delitted by Steve, aka Tech Jesus himself. Our motherboard is the Rampage 6 Extreme X299, and that's gonna be fitted with 128 gigs of G-Scale Trident Z RGB DDR4 at 3200 megahertz. Oh, we've also got two ASUS Strix OC models, GTX 1080 Ti's in SLI, as well as our boot drive, which is a 250 gig Samsung 960 Evo, paired with a pair of two terabyte 960 Pro M.2 NVMe SSDs that are in a RAID 0 configuration, giving us a four terabyte NVMe RAID 0 array. To top it all off, we have our CPU, VRMs, and both of our graphics cards being cooled by a dual custom loop all of this taking place inside of the beautiful Fantex Enthu Elite case, being powered by a 1200 watt DF series power supply from Enermax. So, if that's not impressive enough, just wait till you see the numbers, kids. Let's talk about some data, but actually first, hold on, rewind. Let's, let's do some overclocking first. In fact, I have already done all the testing, of course. So I will share with you what kind of OCs I was able to hit, starting with our 7980XE. Uh, I initially started at 4.0 gigahertz and sort of worked my way up. Overclocking on this motherboard is extremely easy. You pretty much only have to dial in the core multiplier and you can set the V-core, the, the voltage for the CPU to auto and it will automatically just scale up the voltage as needed. And uh, basically what I was able to come out with was 4.6 gigahertz as an all core overclock on all 18 cores. Uh, 4.66 gigahertz was where I found ultimate stability. Um, with the exception of Adobe Premiere Pro Creative Cloud. In fact, I ran all of my gaming, but every single benchmark I ran first, and then I ran Adobe Premiere Pro at the very end. Not the best idea. Now I know to run Premiere Pro first because it is the most likely to crash. In fact, I was only able to successfully render out a file with Premiere Pro at 4.1 gigahertz. So that was the stable clock speed for rendering, but everything else was able to work flawlessly at 4.6 gigahertz, and that gave us a vid or VID of 1.227. I didn't really see a need to overclock our memory. 3200 speed is already pretty fast, especially for an Intel platform system. Uh, you don't really need to increase the megahertz that fast with DDR4 in order to pump out more or additional gaming performance. That works more closely with Ryzen uh, and, uh, and how the Infinity Fabric works there, but Intel not so much. So I just aimed for our rated speed of 30 3200 megahertz. It was very easy. I went to the UEFI and selected the 3200 megahertz profile and boom, voila, on the next boot, it was operating at that rated speed, no problems. As far as our GTX 1080 Ti's are concerned, I maxed out their power and temperature limit sliders, and I was able to get away with a 100 megahertz core clock offset on both of them, which doesn't seem like a lot, but keep in mind that these are already factory overclocked, so there isn't a ton of ceiling room once you get it out of the box. So 100 megahertz on the core clock uh, was the offset there, and then I got a 300 megahertz core uh, memory clock offset on the memory, of course. This was all achieved without touching the voltage. We're using stock voltage here. And uh, with that, I was able to achieve a maximum core clock frequency of 1987 megahertz. Um, and then I think it was, what was it? 1389 megahertz for the memory clock was the max we hit there. That was for the, the top primary GPU. The secondary GPU that was slotted in be beneath it uh, ran about 10 megahertz slower on both the core clock and memory clock. 
uh, frequencies. So it makes sense because even in SLI supported games, you're not gonna have that second GPU being utilized quite as much as the primary card. In all of my testing, that's inclusive of 2K and 4K tests, I only saw a maximum VRAM usage on either card of about six and a half gigs. So plenty of GDDR5X to go around on that front. Now we can talk about temperatures. As far as the CPU goes, we were idling anywhere between 30 and 45 degrees Celsius. Occasionally it would spike up to, you know, 50 or something like that, but for the vast majority of the time, we were we were hovering in the 30s and 40s, which is fantastico. Uh, as far as gaming loads, uh, we saw a maximum CPU temp. Again, this is at 4.6 gigahertz with 18 cores and 36 threads, guys. Um, we saw 69 degrees Celsius was the hottest my CPU got, uh, and I, I would attribute that to uh, to the to the dedicated water cooling loop, as well as the D-Lid process that uh, Gamers Nexus was, was able to, to pitch in here. Um, so I think that did wonders for our temperature. 69 degrees is very favorable, and in case you were curious, that was after about half an hour in Battlefield 1, and then another 15, 20 minutes in GTA 5. Back to back, we did not even hit 70 degrees C on our beastly overclocked uh, CPU there. So the only time I really felt like I had to keep a close eye on our CPU temps was when we were rendering some 4K footage in Adobe Premiere Pro and Media Encoder. Only then did I see the CPU spike well over 70 degrees uh, and actually hit 84 degrees C at its very hottest. And that was on the package, that was the package temp. It was rendering a 10 minute clip, so it took about eight, eight to 10 minutes or so for the CPU to get that hot. Had I been rendering a much longer video, for example, perhaps we might've seen the temperatures rise even further. As far as our GPU temperatures are concerned, we saw very favorable results when idling at just 28 degrees Celsius, and then under load, either playing Battlefield 1 or uh, GTA 5 for about half an hour to an hour, we actually saw our primary card only get up to 42C, whereas our secondary card was a little bit cooler than that at 40 degrees Celsius. So overall, we're, 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 we're hovering in the very low 40s under a heavy load um, at 4K. These games were run at 4K, um, so it definitely taxes the GPUs a bit more there, but we're still seeing very, very nice results with our, uh, our, our dedicated um, water cooling loop there. It is worth noting that all of the thermal testing and all of the, the actual gaming tests that uh, were ran today were conducted with the side panels of the case uh, on in their rightful place. The top and front panels, everything was on. It was an enclosed case. Everything was in its rightful place where it should be. There was no open air testing. Also, the uh, the latest driver was used, the latest Wickle driver for all of our tests. That's 390.666665. And uh, I did run tests at both 2K, 2560 by 1440, and 4K, 3840 by 2160. I did omit all of the 1080 gaming benchmarks simply because didn't really feel it was super relevant for a balls to the wall system such as this one. I uh, just wanted to leave all of the high end stuff in. On that note, let's roll tape and check a look and check a look, take, take a wow. And take a look at the performance benchmarks for the one and only Enthu Elite build. Enjoy. <laughs> Pretty impressive stuff, if I do say so myself. So, some observations that I'll point out. Every game that was run at 2560 by 1440 pretty much topped 
70 FPS on average. In fact, the average overall of the seven games we tested for frame rates was about 139 FPS actually. Um, but at the very least, every single game was well above 70 FPS. When it came to 4K, we saw every game except one get over 60 FPS on average. That one game being PUBG, which makes sense because PUBG is terribly optimized for SLI at the moment. So I think it got like 55 FPS on average, which still isn't bad, but when you consider how much money uh, is in a 1080 Ti SLI setup, it doesn't seem like a huge ROI. But uh, nonetheless, on average, every single game or the total of our games um, averaged out to about 97 FPS at 4K. Additionally, 1% and 0.1% lows were kind of about where they should be. I feel like some of the games looked a little bit low, especially the point uh, the point one percent lows that could indicate a bit of stuttering um, because we are running a multi GPU setup where stuttering is uh, a bit more common in that scenario. Um, the only real oddball. Uh, observation that I found was in Doom, where the frame times were actually worse at 2K than they were at 4K. GTA 5 was the only title that indicated a significant CPU bottleneck in the simple fact that there was hardly any performance drop off when going from 4K to 2K, which is kind of a bittersweet thing for me because on one hand, I'm really glad that the system isn't showing signs of CPU bottlenecking as much as I thought it would, but on the other hand, I should have put some Titan X little peas in there. Clearly the CPU could have handled a bit more graphical horsepower, and now I feel like an idiot for building a crappy system. I can't even look at it anymore. Now while the gaming performance here has no doubt left you aroused in the most peculiar way, equally impressive are the numbers we're seeing from our RAID 0 array with those two 2 terabyte 960 Pro M.2 NVMe SS. Jeez. So let's go ahead and look at my cheat sheet right here. We're getting some crazy reads. I, I used Crystal Disk Mark for the benchmark, and we're getting some sequential reads and writes at Q depth 32 of 6,778 megabytes per second reads and 3,917 megabytes per second writes. The other results using the four kilobyte transfer size at various Q depths are no doubt less impressive, but they are more indicative of real world day-to-day -day tasking uh, than the sequential reads and writes. So um, still very, very favorable numbers all around. I mean, I cannot complain. Now at this point in my lengthy benchmarking session, I could have called it a day right there since I had pretty much tested everything that I had sought out to benchmark. But I didn't stop there. I decided to whip out my own multitasking torture test just to see how the system would behave. So what I essentially did was I, I opened up an instance of Battlefield 1 running at 4K in windowed mode. This was on ultra settings, mind you. Then I began rendering a 10 minute 4K file at 40 megabits per second using Adobe Media Encoder. On top of that, I started streaming with OBS at 3,500 kilobits or megabits per second. Uh, and that was at 1080p, 60 frames per second. And as you might expect from a high-end $12,000 system built by yours truly, it crashed at 4.1 gigahertz, the frequency I had deemed stable to run Adobe Premiere Pro and Media Encoder at. So I basically had to knock it down to 4.0 gigahertz. At that point, everything ran like clockwork. No crashes, no errors. It actually rendered out the video. Granted, it took about three to four times longer than it did when we were only just rendering and the gaming wasn't all that smooth. Granted, we had some really playable frame rates, but we did encounter some stuttering mainly because the CPU was already at 100% from rendering alone. And all of a sudden we're using, we're throwing a, a CPU intensive game at it while streaming, which is also very CPU intensive. So uh, there was some stuttering, but I mean, it was playable. That is all to say that uh, it's a pretty badass system. And if you're curious at all, it was eating up about 30 gigabytes of my DRAM at any given moment, um, which is a shit ton of RAM. But uh, you know, given the configuration that I had, it's only about a little over 20% of my overall memory being used. And I just realized something, I lied to you. Earlier in this video, I said that 84 degrees Celsius was the hottest I saw the CPU get wrong. During this torture test, it spiked up to 91 degrees Celsius, which is quite toasty. At the same time, when you consider everything that it was doing with an all core overclock at four gigahertz on 18 cores, it really ain't that bad. That being said, this is a very rare scenario that I probably won't find myself in too often. That is the definition of rare. Good job, Kyle. Uh, the GPUs uh, were actually hitting 32 to 33 degrees Celsius. And you're like, whoa, wait, how, how is that possible that the GPUs are running cooler when it was gaming and doing all this other stuff as opposed to just gaming when it was like 40 to 42 degrees Celsius? That's because the GPU utilization was actually way down low. We were seeing anywhere from 25 to 
percent utilization on both cards and one explanation i have for that is that we were rendering at the time with the mercury playback engine feature enabled in adobe premiere pro cc which utilizes cuda so technically these cards were already sort of being used by the encoder perhaps that's why they weren't able to deliver as much uh output for our actual game Winding things down here, overall this system performs exactly how I would expect it to, which is very good at everything. I'm pretty much convinced at this point to turn this thing into my daily driver for video editing here at the office. And that's exactly what I plan to do. So guys, let me know what you think in the comments below, what you thought of all the results that we shared today. And also feel free to toss me a like on this video if you enjoyed it, it helps me a lot. Don't forget to get subscribed so you don't miss any more tech stuff coming at you really soon. And feel free to follow me on Floatplane so you can watch all my videos a week early without ads. I'll drop a link for that in the description. But apart from that, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I am so glad to be back, as I mentioned before. Can't wait to start making some more awesome content for you guys here in 2018. Super excited for all that. Thank you all for sticking with me. Have a good one, and I will see you guys in the next video.